India's advancement in economic and social spheres is forging a new paradigm for global development. Make in India, Aaj Samay Ke Maag. We are enjoying a continuum of growth, progress and tradition. India is on the board. And with the unwavering certainty of a bold vision, we've propelled India onto an unstoppable path. Our economy is constantly renewing and reinventing, putting India in a globally enviable position. And a meticulously outlined political agenda will strengthen our regional and global clout. Presenting the fourth edition of the Times Now Summit, the confluence of leading policy makers, strategists, experts and influencers shaping India's unstoppable growth only on the Times Network. Please welcome the former Chief Economic Advisor to the Prime Minister and the present Executive Director with the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Krishnamurti V. Subramaniam. He is going to be in conversation with Managing Editor for Times Network as well as the Business Head of Times Influence, Mihir Bhatt. Dr. Krishnamurti, thank you so much for joining us and a very good morning to you. Uh, you know, this topic is actually very close to our heart because uh, at Times Network we keep uh, trying to create content which delves into future and uh, sort of uh, we do crystal ball gazing about uh, what is India's growth trajectory. Uh, I believe uh, you have a surprise in store for us. There is a new book uh, that you are coming up with and it is titled very aptly India at 100. Envisioning Tomorrow's uh, Economic Powerhouse. So first of all, congratulations for that. Uh, if you can just give us a sort of a preview about one, why you believe India will be economic powerhouse and second, what is your vision about India at 100? Thanks for uh, providing me the opportunity to talk about this book, India at 100. It should be forthcoming uh, in a couple of months. Um, so the basic uh, idea is that with the kind of growth that India has registered now in the last uh, 10 years, if we can redouble uh, the good policies that we've implemented over the uh, last 10 years and uh, accelerate the reforms, then India can grow at 8% um, from here on till 2047. And if India grows at 8%, India can be a $55 trillion economy. Now, that will sound quite audacious, um, especially if you take into account uh, the fact that ENY predicts India to be a $26 uh, economy by 2047. So that's about, you know, less than half. Um, so viewers would wonder, you know, where are the differences. So let me explain for our viewers. So if we assume 7% growth in real terms, 5% inflation, which is what has been there ever since the inflation targeting framework has been implemented, and 3% depreciation of the rupee, uh, that translates into 9% uh, growth in dollar terms, 7 plus 5 minus 3. Why minus 3? Because depreciation of the rupee actually subtracts from, from uh, you know, growth in dollar terms. So at 9%, using the rule of 70, which is typically what we all use for uh, calculating the number of years it takes to double our money at 9%, you know, uh, 9 times 8 is 72. So approximately in 8 years, you know, the GDP will double. Now, if we start from 2023 onwards, that's 24 years. In 24 years, you know, doubling every 8 years means 3 times doubling. That's 8 times essentially the GDP multiplying. So if we take the GDP number for, um, you know, 2023, approximately 3.25 trillion, um, and I'm using approximate numbers so that our viewers can see the, 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 the ballpark numbers. So, you know, uh, 8 times uh, multiplication will mean from 3.25 to 6.5, from 6.5 to 13, and from 13 to 26. So you can see how the 26 trillion, uh, you know, uh, GDP prediction by ENY rests on what I believe is uh, you know, an important but uh, incorrect assumption uh, of, of depreciation at 3%, which is what has historically been the case. But in my assessment, there are two key trends that are you know, uh, on in the economy which we need to recognize, which will lead to much lower depreciation. 
One, as I mentioned, the inflation targeting framework has been implemented, as a result of which inflation has to be between 2 to 6 percent, with 4 percent as the as the median. Historically, if you look at, you know, in the last few years, uh, you know, inflation has been 5 percent. Um, so now when you look at the inflation that prevailed from 1990 onwards, or even, you know, earlier period, inflation in India has been 7 percent plus historically. That's the average. So, you know, going forward, we can actually say, therefore, inflation will be at least 2% lower compared to what has been historically the case. And we, you know, we know economists, you know, understand this very well, that when inflation is higher, then the depreciation of the currency is also higher. Uh, sir, I also want to understand, you know, because there is a lot of thrust on uh, the manufacturing and uh, we, we all talk about Atma Nirbhar Bharat and Make in India. And in fact, there is a lot of focus on strategic sectors as well, like, uh, for example, semiconductors or making India self-reliant uh, in space of defense. In fact, immediately after this, we'll be joined by Honorable Defense Minister Sri Rajnath Singh, who is going to talk about it. Uh, but I want to understand, in your opinion, in your view, between now and 2047, which are the sectors which will predominantly drive India's growth within manufacturing. I'm just focusing on manufacturing right now within that. And to do that, you know, what are the steps or reforms that we uh, need to take? So, um, you know, on this, we had actually written about it in the 2019-20 um, economic survey. If you look at China, the way China grew, it utilized its demographic dividend. Uh, in the next 25 years, India also actually has this opportunity to utilize its demographic dividend. So India needs to actually not only do value-added, you know, manufacturing, which of course uh, will, will happen later, but also do, you know, manufacturing like assembling. Um, you know, many critics, for instance, will say, oh, we should be only doing value-added stuff. But I've actually firmly believed that you cannot, you know, start running without having learned to walk. Um, and in the case of manufacturing, first assembling, is the walking and higher value added stuff is the you know is, is the running let's take a few examples let's take you know uh, the automobile sector in india in the 1980s when maruti was you know was was uh, uh, created started operations we were importing almost entire and it just the assembling of the car was maruti car was being done in india but over time you see actually the the ancillary sector the entire you know supply chain developed as well and the same thing is now happening with electronics as well. So it is really critical in order to provide good jobs for our youth to utilize the demographic dividend that we do not just, you know, focus on the higher value added stuff. I think we should be doing both. We should be actually letting the organic growth happen, which is start, you know, assembling, you know, in many of these areas, electronics, it's happening. And then naturally the, the, the supply chain will expand. So I think we should not be too, you know, uh, sort of uh, stubborn saying that, oh, we should be only doing the high, high value added stuff. That is important, but at the same time, assembling is also critical. One last question, uh, uh, Dr. Krishnamurti. Uh, you know, we are in a very uh, unique, evolving scenario as far as uh, the global economy is concerned. So we have a complete uh, shape shifting as far as uh, the, I would say, the globalization is concerned. We have a conflict which is going on in Europe and it's every day, uh, you know, it threatens to expand from its current limited scope. Uh, we have conflict in Middle East uh, and we have uh, the so-called uh, almost imminent uh, phase two of US-China trade war. Uh, what would be your uh, concerns or red flags uh, on global growth uh, considering, uh, you know, the current geopolitical environment that we are in? I think uh, the concerns that you've highlighted are quite germane. Um, if you look at the, you know, global pro growth projections that are being done by the fund, these are at a, you know, at, at a two decade lows. Um, so clearly global growth is getting affected by not only the trend against globalization, but also some of the conflicts that are, that have erupted in different parts of the world. So global growth will be, you know, even going forward, I think we will have to actually take Take into account the fact that global growth may not be very supportive. If we get tailwinds, tailwinds from global growth, that's great, but we cannot, you know, uh, bank on it. Therefore, India needs to really strengthen its domestic economy.
economy, uh, you know, make sure, for instance, if you look at, you know, if you sort of do an accounting uh, classification, about 58% of our GDP comes from our own domestic consumption. And therefore, you know, we do have the potential, if we can create enough jobs, you know, uh, um, that will lead to much higher consumption. So we need to make sure that our reforms actually strengthen, you know, the, 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 our domestic economy. And for that, I think social uh, and economic inclusion, you know, inclusive growth is really critical. Absolutely. So my key takeaway is that contrary to popular estimates, India can actually become a $50 trillion plus economy by 2047, provided we don't take our growth for granted, provided we don't take the solid base that we have for granted, continue on the path of reforms and continue to uh, deliver uh, year on year uh, on our promises. Thank you so much. Time to speak about her economic prowess as the leading emerging economy. What are the important pillars that India needs to uphold to ensure that its current growth rate stays the course and grows? Absolutely. In fact, having now become the fifth largest economy in the world, how can India dethrone the number four and number three economies? In fact, to share his views on how India will sustain growth momentum, please welcome the chairperson of the 16th Finance Commission, Arvind Panagrahiya. He will be in conversation with our managing editor for Times Network, as well as the business head of Times Influence, Mihir Bhatt. Uh, Mr. Pangadia, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you can see, uh, the theme of uh, this year's Times Now Summit uh, is actually India Unstoppable. And there are various factors which uh, make India unstoppable today. But uh, we would like to hear it from you, that in your view, uh, as an economist and as an expert uh, on policies, what makes India unstoppable? Great question, Mihir. Um, so there are two or three factors which I think uh, uh, account for uh, India's current um, state uh, in which it is on the way to becoming a leading power. Uh, first of all, you know, it is a, a rare example of a developing country which has sustained democracy for more than 75 years now. You know, it's difficult if you think about it, perhaps Costa Rica, perhaps Jamaica, but very few, you know, countries uh, which uh, after Second World War became independent uh, uh, and, and were developing countries um, have sustained democracy for that long. That is important because you know, in democracy, consensus building takes time, but once consensus has been built up, it also sustains. Unlike authoritarian regimes where, you know, uh, change of leaders can really create upheavals as, for example, we are witnessing currently in China. So that's one fact. Second is that uh, we have now sustained economic reforms for about 30, 32, 33 years. Uh, so a lot of the reforms that were required uh, and required consensus building are now in place. And there is also largely consensus in place for some of the outstanding reforms about which we can speak later. Uh, but, but the, the uh, road for those reforms is uh, perhaps uh, cleaner and clearer than, than it was 30 years ago. A uh, third factor I would point out is that uh, timing from India's point of view is absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, you know, among the major economies, uh, there are no competitors, so to say, uh, uh, because um, uh, really, uh, uh, you know, US and Europe, these are mature economies, which probably would grow 2%, 3% at the most. Uh, China, which would have been the major competitor, has done kind of its major innings. Uh, if you look at the record of the countries that have grown rapidly, like South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, in the past, uh, at the end of the day, generally this kind of very rapid growth happens for three decades. Uh, after fourth decade, you know, in the fourth decade, you'd come down to, you know, from eight to 10%, you come down to 6%, 5%. And uh, then in the fifth decade, you're to three or 4%. 
Right. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Pankaria, are you saying that uh, China, because you mentioned about China, uh, that as far as growth possibilities uh, are concerned, uh, they have already peaked out because the general belief about India is that uh, India's Amrit Kal has just begun and next uh, two to three decades are actually going to drive uh, a huge amount of momentum uh, about uh, you know, towards making India a developed nation by 2047. So, is that happening in tandem, in sync, that China is slowing down and India is picking up pace just at the right time? Yes, I think, you know, that, that was uh, the, the gist of what I said. Um, another way to look at it is that, you know, in terms of per capita income, we're still below $3,000, about somewhere 2500 roughly or so. Uh, that means that the gap between our per capita income and what other countries have achieved is extremely large. Uh, and, and, and this is, what, what that says is that even with the existing technologies, as we accumulate more capital over time, we can actually raise the productivity levels, the average worker productivity levels to significantly higher levels. I mean, you know, you can compare with South, you can compare with China where this per capita income is somewhere between thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars compared with South uh, Korea, which is thirty-two, thirty-three thousand uh, dollars. That's a very large gap. And what, what we know is that this is doable with the existing technologies. Uh, and, and with our kind of gap, it really places us in a great place. You had a view about electoral bonds and now, I mean, we have a Supreme Court judgment, but uh, uh, I want to ask you that, was it a step in the right direction, was it done properly, could it have been more transparent because now what we have is uh, a bit of a situation as far as electoral bonds are concerned and when you talk of reforms, I think the biggest reform that is required uh, in the country uh, is actually the political system and political funding. So what is your take on that? Well, this is an area where the reform is extremely, extremely difficult, there is no doubt. Um, and, and that's the reason actually, you know, uh, it, it looks so difficult that uh, not many people even write about it. Uh, you know, judicial reforms, police reforms, uh, uh, and likewise the electoral reforms. These are very difficult territories. Uh, um, uh, specifically on the electoral reforms, you know, I had been persuaded by the arguments that uh, the then finance minister, Mr. Arun Jaitley, had made. You know, I remember around, I think, 2018 or 2019, he had come to Columbia University where uh, we had hosted him. And uh, this very question was asked, uh, you know, whether uh, the lack of transparency in electoral bonds was uh, an issue. And uh, he made, actually gave a good explanation saying that, look, you know, uh, uh, Currently, there are two, I mean, at that time, prior to the, uh, the electoral bonds, there were two ways to give the money, either cash or you write check. Uh, and check, of course, provided full transparency, to where transparency, who gave to whom, um, and, and cash provided no transparency. Uh, but corporates were very unwilling to write the checks uh, uh, because of the two-way transparency, uh, and so everything was happening in cash. So his argument at the time was that, look, you know, this is a halfway house where at least, you know, you can try to eliminate, you know, unaccounted corporate money entering uh, the, the uh, electoral process. So at least this is the money that is accounted for, uh, which is reported to the tax authorities and everything, so it appears on their tax returns also. Uh, uh, except that, you know, it did not provide the kind of two-way transparency in the way the checks would. But then checks nobody was willing to use. Sir, one last question. Uh, if you look at the geopolitical situation globally, and obviously India uh, today is playing a very pivotal role uh, in the global growth, what is your view? Because there are so many things which are, or events I would say, including elections which are happening this year, there is uncertainty about the outcome of US elections in terms of how uh, the new US administration will behave uh, when it comes to dealing with China and the so-called trade war that has been uh, going on for some time. The entire conflict in the Middle East, uh, including the, uh, you know, the stress in the Red Sea area where India is also playing a very vital role in keeping those lines open. You have a 
war in Ukraine that is weighing very heavily on Europe. Uh, in the middle of all of this, India is a beacon of hope, but at the same time, uh, India will have to be very watchful of how the global events play out. What is your sense in terms of economic impact of these global events uh, in next one or two years uh, on the prospects of Indian growth? So look, you know, what conflicts currently exist, I think we'll be able to navigate those quite okay. We have navigated so far extremely well. Uh, we have kept our friendships and we have not uh, uh, risked our friendships which are relatively newer. Uh, we have in fact strengthened those friendships also. Um, now, you know, one event that really lurks in the background um, is, is, you know, Taiwan-China conflict and, and what shape they, that might take, I think, you know, we'll only know when, when that happens. Um, that could certainly be a challenge. Uh, that will certainly be a big challenge. But as long as, you know, that, that conflict doesn't get out of hand. But you see that as a possibility, a well, real conflict between it's, it's China and Taiwan. There. It's certainly there. You know, we don't know what, what will happen or what will not happen and, and what form it might take. Um, but, but that's something we'll need to be very watchful of. Uh, um, uh, but, but other than that, uh, the other uncertainties you point out, for example, changes of the governments, for example, in the United States, if that were to happen and all. Uh, luckily, in, in that area, the consensus in the United States with respect to India has been bipartisan. Uh, we have had three or four administration changes and from Republican to Democrat, Democrat to Republican. Uh, and uh, this one relationship, U.S.-India, has continued to uh, flourish and, and, and get better and better, warmer and warmer. So uh, uh, I, I'm not concerned on that front, certainly, you know, I think that relationship will remain. Right. Uh, in fact, sir, I like the sound of it. World's largest democracy, also world's fastest growing democracy. On that note, thank you so much uh, for joining us here. Uh, and India is indeed unstoppable. Thank you so much, sir.